you have not seen him, you love him. Let's pray. Lord Christ, indeed, open the eyes of our hearts this morning. Open our ears. As we've heard your word, now may it sink deep down into our hearts and renew our minds and regenerate our souls. And now open my lips that I might speak your truth and your gospel as we reflect on your word. And anything that is not of you, Lord, I pray that you will protect your people from it. But everything that is of you, Lord, I pray that it will be effective and will call and convict your people. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So this morning I want us to reflect on the fruits of living faith. You know, we've been talking about um, the nature of faith recently, and especially last week, our union with Christ, our living union with the living Christ in our souls. And this morning I want to look for signs of the presence of that living faith that's produced by the indwelling of the resurrected Christ within each of us. Uh, the same one who lives today, and that was risen back then, lives today and forevermore, is the same one that lives in the heart of every Christian. His power and his life are in them. So how do I discern whether or not I have his life flowing in me? What do I look for? What signs and what produce, you know, what fruit is there? Um, well, I'm glad you've asked the question. You're in the right place. Peter's going to help us out this morning. Um, he, he gives us uh, some great signs of, of that living life uh, within us. But first, I want to get started with Thomas for a moment. What Jesus said to him. You know, apparently, seeing is a big deal. This is what ties all of our readings together. One, one interesting exercise is to try and figure out what was in the minds of the people who were putting the lectionary together. And I said, okay, why did they pair that Old Testament reading or Acts with that letter of Paul and, or Peter and then this gospel story? What ties them all together? And this morning, what they're going for is the importance of seeing. That's the thread that connects them all. Um, it's a big deal. Peter tells us that David was a prophet, right? And he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. That's really striking, isn't it? David wasn't just talking about his own life. Peter, Peter even says in his sermon that um, when he says, Your Holy One will, will not see corruption. He wasn't talking about, he says, David's dead. He did see corruption, right? He is dead in the ground. His tomb is nearest to this day. Um, he wasn't talking about himself. Rather, David saw as a prophet, and he foretold what was going to happen through his descendant, the Christ, the Messiah, for our salvation. So he, David foresaw it. And the disciples, they finally believed when they saw the risen Christ, Right? Thomas gets a hard rap, but he's just like the rest of them. None of them, even Mary, they didn't believe until they had their eyes opened and they saw the risen Jesus Christ standing before them, eating fish and whatever else. They had to see it for themselves before they would believe. And Thomas is just like them. He had the um, bad timing to, to miss that first appearance of the Lord, but he sees him now, right? Um, but he, when, when they told him the Lord is risen... He didn't believe it. Why? Because he wanted to see him, right? And touch him. He wanted to be just like them. He wasn't any worse than the rest of them. Um, he wouldn't believe, he says, until I see and even touch his wounds. And he wanted verification with his senses. And so that's what Jesus gives him. He gives him empirical verification. But then he goes on to say, famously, Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Right? I mean, you think about it, that's a really tricky thing. Um, is Jesus really laying out the impossible here? I mean, think about the importance of being able to verify things with, for yourself. Right? Um, you know, I, I wouldn't trust this lectern here unless I had experience that it was solid, right? And I pounded on it enough to know... <laughs> That it holds up. Um, empirical scientific method has a lot going for it. We've got a lot of discoveries about our world, right? We've been able to prove and test things um, in experiments and, and through experience of our own in life. And so this is how we learn about our world. This is how we rightly put our faith in things. If I didn't know this floor was solid, I wouldn't stand on it, you know? It's kind of how it works. Or it's kind of like, uh, um, I'm not going to, think of those suspension bridges you see in the movies like Indiana Jones or something, right? I'm not going to get on one of those things until I know it's anchored firmly and the materials are solid. 
There's none of those rotten wood planks that my foot's going to fall through, yeah? I'm not going on the thing until I know it's solid. Because there's crocodiles down there and all that. Right? Um, I'm not going to trust it until I know it's trustworthy. And that's just how so much of our life works. is through using our senses to verify the things are trustworthy. Now let's move on to something that's a little hard to demonstrate empirically, but still this holds true. We need to experience them before we'll trust them. Um, think about relationships. Why would anyone entrust their life to, um, or their, their fate to someone or something that they've simply heard about? You know, think of it this way. Um, let's say you started and raised up a very successful company. You, let's say you started it in your garage or something, right? And you built it up into this multi-billion dollar corporation. And let's say you need to step away for some reason from the day-to-day -day stuff, right? Now, you've invested your life in this project. Blood, sweat, and tears, and sleepless nights, and the whole thing, to building this business. You defy the odds, and, and, and you've, you've built this thing up with painful sacrifice, but for some reason, you need to step away from the day-to-day. -day. Maybe a new business opportunity has promoted it, or has come to you, I mean, and, and you're not like Elon Musk. You can't take on, like, five major corporations at once. <laughs> And so you need to step away. Um, maybe there's a new venture. Maybe there's a health challenge or some situation in your family. Whatever. It doesn't matter. But you need someone to come in and run your company for you. All right? And let's say you've heard about this one candidate who seems exceptional. Just the right fit. Everybody's singing his praises. You know he's excellent. You know he's, he, his reputation precedes him. And, and everybody's telling you, just give the guy the job sight unseen. Would you do it? I hope not. That would be silly. Right? You need to spend time together. You need to interview the person to make sure it's a fit. Make sure they're who they are. You've got to do a background check. You've got to have this relationship built before you will hand off your baby to someone new. Right? You're going to need to check it out. You know, they got to go through a background check and all that stuff. In these kinds of situations, blind faith is not a wise way to go. You know, we need personal contact. We need personal assurance. We need personal experience, right? We have to know that the one to whom we're entrusting precious things is worthy of our trust. Are you with me so far? So what do we make of, is Jesus just being cruel to Thomas here when he says, uh, you know, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed? What he's saying is you should have taken their word for it, you know? Um, is he telling Thomas that blind faith is the way to go? A lot of pastors and teachers will tell you yes, and I'm here to tell you no. They're wrong. Now here's, here's what I mean by that. Um, just because Jesus says we shouldn't rely on our sight, doesn't mean he's ruling out any and every other mode of apprehension. Right? And, and so what I'm suggesting to you is that Christians come to believe in the gospel and trust in Jesus Christ through something other than their eyes. You know? See, that's really what we... What, let's see, when you talk about faith, we really tend to mean blind faith, don't we? Right? This is, um, it's almost like we're hoping for good in the face of facts that suggest it probably isn't wise to hope for good. Uh, you know, and so what, what this is, just have faith is, it, it can't be really a serious thing. It's, sort of, it's just more of wanting a, a positive mindset, an optimistic outlook, right? Um, even though we're not exactly sure how it's going to work, I'm going to have faith that it's going to work out fine. You don't actually know that it's going to work out fine. You're just hoping it will, right? Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. I mean, it's better than moping around and being depressed all the time. So I recommend that attitude in general, right? It's going to be a positive person to hope for the best. Um, but that's not biblical faith. That's not what Jesus is getting at here. Because, well, number one, here's a good place to start. Biblical faith involves specific truths from God's word. Right? That God has immeasurable love for us. That Christ died to reconcile sinners to God. Truths like, uh, you know, we can have life after death. That, you know, God is of this kind of character. He is not this kind of a God. Right? We, we need to get very specific. and We need to have this information. 
But what I'm saying is it is more than information that produces faith. It starts with that. But it's more than that. Because you can believe the facts. You can believe every word in the Bible. You can, you, can say, you can admit that it's true and all of it's right. And as important as those things are, you can say all that and still not be a Christian. All right? Now, as we noted last week, truth, true faith is the product of a vital and living union of Jesus Christ with our souls. All right? It, true faith is when, is when the living, risen Christ indwells us. Right? And the same power, that indestructible life that rose from the dead, you know, we know now that it has raised our souls from the death of rebellion and enmity with God in a new life. Paul describes it this way. In Ephesians 2, he says, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, and you were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And one of my favorite words in Scripture is a convention, but, but God, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. And then later on, He says He wants them to experience and to know that power, that dwelling within. He says, He prays for them that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that they would, he says, know the love of Christ. That they would know it. That they would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. You see, there it is. You can know things, but that's not enough. You need to have this love of Christ which surpasses that knowledge, which uses it and launches from it and rises above it. Right? That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. See, this is so much more than just having the right doctrine or the right opinions, Yeah? This is describing an awareness within your soul and your heart, in your mind even, you know, uh, an experience, even a personal, individual apprehension of the power of God abiding and working within you. You know, producing a conviction of God's presence, God's goodness, God's love, right? Conviction about how foolish and corrupting our former way of thinking and loving and acting was. And, uh, and, and a perception of that though I was in rebellion with God, I can now come to Him by the mercy offered me in Jesus Christ. And, and so in this conviction, I despair of my own abilities. In my own ability to please Him and all my so-called goodness, I realize it's all trash and filthy rags and I entrust myself wholly into His love and His mercy and I throw myself into His arms. Knowledge alone won't get you there. We have to respond by the power of God working it within us to the knowledge that's presented to us. We have to have His life within. See, this requires knowledge of doctrine, but it is much more than doctrine. Can you see how this is not blind faith? This is th these are things that are clearly apprehended and perceived, just not with our eyeballs, right? But with our hearts and our soul. With God opening the eyes of our hearts, right? Have you ever said, oh, when someone tells you something true and you get it, you're like, oh, I see. Are you using your eyes? No, it is a figure of speech. It is a metaphor to talk about. You're grasping it, right? This is the same thing here. We're talking about something that happens within the heart, perceiving and apprehending the power of God. And that is why we can know it. This is how and why Christians believe. This is what Jesus is going for in Thomas and the rest of them. Right? And so... That's established, I hope. And now the question remains. What are the signs of this inner life? And now this is where Peter's going to help us. So you can maybe open up your bulletin and look at that first Peter reading. And, and we, you can't, there's no mistaking its fruit. At the beginning of the reading, he says this. He says, he has caused us to be born again to what? To a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A living hope. Um, you know, start off just, He has caused us. See, we no longer ask for this to be present in ourselves than a newborn baby asks to be born. Right? How many of you ask to be born? To be conceived and then, you know, labored out and come out of your mother? None of you asked for it. It just happened to you, didn't it? 
right? Um, this is something that happens to us by God's mercy. This, we're born again to a living hope, right? And it, it, it happens to us, it, and it causes us, because it's happening to us, then we, we sort of participate with it. I think every baby has to labor in some way with its mother, even though it's passive and the whole thing. It's sort of there. You can't help it, right? It's being pushed out. And, uh, and, and so the baby's there in it too, and he's like, ah, I can't wait to get out of here. So we, we ask for it, right? And we work with him. And the baby's not happy when he gets out all the time, is he? No, they're usually here. She's, she's crying her head off, you know? Um, but ask her if, you, if she could speak English. A few hours later, she's glad she came out. I think you know, she's holding her mother and learning how to her. I think she would say, yeah, I'm so glad I was born. Right? Look at this beautiful, bright world. And my mother, I can see her with my eyes and I can hear her voice and all this, you know? Um, you know, and there's no stopping this new birth. Um, that comes to the Christian. It, it happens, and it might be uncomfortable, but in the end, you're glad it did. And, and, and this is a living thing that is produced in our souls, and it's the life of God within us. And, uh, you know, this is a living hope. This isn't a hope like all the hopes we have for earthly things that we'd like to happen, things we hope will work out. Right? That's simply wishful thinking. And maybe we can do a little planning towards that end, but there are no guarantees in life. We all know that by now, I hope. Right? But we can have these kind of, this isn't the kind of hope we're talking about. We're talking about a living hope, a real hope. One that, one that is of its own, right? It, it, it comes from God. And it surges within us. And, um, and it turns our hearts and our minds to God and our, our goal, our purpose being in Him. So this living hope from God produces in us. It turns us back to God. And, and, and we have these promises of God that we're now trusting in, right? These things, these declarations of future certainties that we don't yet have, I don't see them, and I can't hold on to them. But there's this thing in my heart that makes me cling to it and hold on to it. Sometimes it even defies logic in my mind, but I'm clinging to these things because I am. It's just the power of God working within these, a testimony that His power is within you. And, you know, Peter calls this an inheritance. It's an inheritance. And how does he describe this inheritance? It's not like the inheritance from your parents or your grandparents or whatever that maybe somebody could squander in, right? And, and, and use up. No, this is imperishable. This inheritance is undefiled, he said. There's nothing wrong with it. There's no corruption in it. It's unfading. It will never go stale or spoil. And it is kept in heaven for you. It's got your name on it. Isn't that something? Right, this, and our confidence, our hope is in this, in being with God and all the things He has for us. And this living hope, He says, I was tempted to preach on suffering today, but I've done that fairly recently, I think. But it's not even squashed by our circumstances. Even our sufferings of body, soul, and mind, and, and whatever, um, we've become so confident in His love and filled with hope that our sufferings only purify this living hope. It is so strong. Nothing can crush it, nothing can squelch it. It is a living hope, born of God, coming into us and leading us back to God. And, and he says that this living hope within it is remarkable. Here, here are things that it produces. He says, it exists and it can be known by its effects, even though you don't see it with your eyes. He says, living hope testifies to itself in other ways. Now, this is near the end of that First Peter reading. Right? He says the effects essentially are remarkable. He says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. All right? Um, think of the signs of genuine love when we're looking for genuine signs of this living hope. Um, no one needs to tell me that I love my boys. I just do. I, I just love them. You know, it's, it's an theory to me. You know? Oh, yes, I understand that when one is a good father, one ought to love one's own children. And that is, therefore, why I love my boys. Therefore, right? And all this garbage. Who <laughs> thinks like that? Nobody does, right? You don't have to tell me to love. Oh, well, you, you know, you should really love your children. Oh, thank you. I didn't think of that before. You're right. I should. I do love my No. I look at my boys, or I think of them, and it just wells up within my heart. Right? It is a living love. And I would sacrifice anything and everything for their sake. You know, I look at my wife. 
and the gratitude I feel for her, right? And my dedication to her, and it fills my heart, and, and the love I have for her is such that the, the, the mere prospect of, of running off with someone else makes me sick to my stomach because of my love for her, yeah? This is that you don't have to tell people these things. It just, it is within them or it isn't. Um, and all I've been talking about in these two examples is, is human affection. Right? Human attachments, which are good and powerful. But how much stronger is that love that comes down from God, from the divine life into our lives, knows when we truly believe. Right? As powerful as human love is, how much stronger is the divine love of God as it works in those on whom he has set his love? Yeah? I mean, his love is unstoppable. It is all powerful. It is perfectly effective love. And so, one of the outstanding questions after a statement like that is do you love him in return? Uh, powerful affection like I'm, I've been talking about but yet more so yeah these are the signs of life that it dwells within us um, if you love him in return rejoice that you've been born again to a living hope if not call out to him and ask him for it and I'm sorry not sorry but I pray that you find no peace until it is given to you by God I want you to be unsettled. I want you to be unsatisfied by your life. It is not from the love of God. I pray that he upsets you and that you know no peace, no rest, no satisfaction so you've known the strength of his love surging within you and turning you to him. All right, you might say thank you for that very much. And, uh, that's what I'm here to do. All right? And so that, that's just one effect is that though you have not seen him, you love him. That's how you know it's real. I can't even explain why I love him sometimes. I just do, you know. Um, another effect of this living hope. He says, though you do not now see him, you believe in him. Right? And he's talking about, you know, believe. We talked about this before recently. You know, this is a trust that is profound. And it is born of knowledge, of experience, right? And love. It's not blind faith. This is a confidence that's produced by the perceptible work of God within you. So your confidence in him is based on what you've experienced about his character and his love and what he's done for you. And this is, and this is so strong and sure that you'll entrust him with your whole self. These are signs that this living hope is within you. And so you just give yourself completely with abandon. Right? Without reserve and just joy and, and, and all of it. Um, only a real perception of a real person will produce this in the heart of the believer. Finally, Peter tells us that through this living hope, he says, though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. You know, this isn't a contrived rejoicing. This is a spontaneous bursting forth within the heart. You know, if you are connected to some of the same people I'm connected to on social media, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody here, but uh, there were, I don't know what happened, must have been like 100,000 young girls go see Taylor Swift this weekend at some football stadium. It's this remarkable image of, uh, you know, there, there's Taylor Swift down there on the platform on the stage, right? Just you could barely see her, and then there's this ocean of humanity all around her, right? And that stadium was filled with something I don't know, hundred. I'm just guessing at the number. I don't know, but like a hundred thousand, like teeny boppers with their hearts exploding and rejoicing. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's been a while for you, but I think all of us have experienced a feeling like that in even some human way at some point in our lives. Yeah. Maybe it was when you started dating someone or you, you got into the college of your choice and you know, you, your whole future is just laying out before you. This feeling that comes up within the joy or maybe seeing a child born, whatever it is, yeah? You know, I mean, I mean, who here has cried for joy before? 
Yeah. I mean, th- these are feelings that we have. And, and all those things, oh, we, so far we've just been talking about things that are gifts from God. And I'm not saying Taylor Swift is a gift from God, but you know what I mean. All right? I mean, in her person, I'm sure she's sweet, whatever, right? She's God's creature. <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, all these things are just our response to the gifts of God. What about our response to the giver of all good gifts? How much better is he than the things he gives us? Right? And this is the kind of response that Peter's talking about here. I mean, again, I, sorry, not sorry, but I long for there to be tears in your eyes and a, a buoyant sort of tightening in your chest with the goodness and the loving kindness of the living God existing within you. Right? And, and you knowing God working in you um, through the same power and life that rose Jesus from the dead. Right? That, that has been given to you and is reserved for you before the foundation of the world, right? And now his presence with you currently. The same resurrection power dwelling within. Um, enjoying it now, and there's an the eager expectation of all that lies ahead for us. This is the living hope that Peter's talking about. As Paul says, quoting Isaiah, No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined. What God has prepared for those who love Him. And so a major part of my responsibility to you before God is to put these things before you. All right? What you do with them is between you and God. But my prayer is that you will think on these things. Again, you won't forget them over lunch or whatever. But you'll continue meditating on these things that I'm putting before you. And that you'll search your hearts. You'll examine your lives and you'll you look at your, your loves and your joys and your hopes and all that and you'll think critically about how they relate to God. Am I in love with His creation or am I in love with Him? And I have to confront you with these things because it's to your benefit and to your salvation. And Peter says the same thing, doesn't he? He says, you know, looking for these signs and enjoying them, he says, you obtain the outcome of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. That's what we're in the business of doing here. And uh, as John reminds us, he says, you know, I'm not just telling you the story about Jesus so you can have something to read before you go to bed. Or some story to read to the kids or whatever. He says, you know, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Lord, we live in a world that is um, full of death, a world that is chaotic and unsettling and all too often joyless. Lord, please, in your mercy, turn us to yourself where true joys are to be found. We ask this for Jesus Christ's sake.